Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so first off, um, I, I, I'm very uh, grateful to Sri and all the organizers for making this really interesting seminar series possible and, and for the invitation to speak here. Um, my lab has long been interested in pushing the limits of measuring mass um, in, in solution. And today we wanted to highlight two projects uh, going on in the lab. Um, I, I'm gonna pre present the first one and it's about characterizing viruses. Uh, and this is work that's spearheaded by Yurgos Katsikis who's actually also online here that can be involved in the discussion um, at the end. And then the second part is going to be about uh, looking at growth properties of polyploid cells. Uh, and this is gonna be presented by Timu Mietinit. So let me begin with the first part uh, on viruses. Uh, and let me first just define the problem. Um, so uh, viruses have shown great promise as a way to achieve gene therapy um, where a defective gene can be replaced by a good one. Um, but the manufacturing is, is not perfect. Um, and in fact, it turns out to be very difficult to manufacture these viruses um, with the fidelity that's needed. And one particular virus, the adeno-associated virus, or AAV, has shown a particular promise um, as a delivery tool for, for gene therapy. And if you look at what comes out of the production of these viruses, um, you will see that not all the viruses that are made have a full capsid in them. So some of them have um, incomplete capsids inside, um, which of course uh, is, is problematic. And so one of the holy grails in the manufacturing field would be able to have an inline tool for being able to quantify uh, what fraction of viruses have full, complete, intact capsids, and use that information in real time to control processing parameters, kind of in a closed loop system, so that you could optimize the product that comes out. And so if you think about these viruses that are made, uh, from a size point of view, they're the same, whether they have the DNA uh, capsid inside or not. Um, but if you look at from the mass point of view, these viruses weigh a couple of atograms and the difference between a full and empty capsid uh, is about one atogram for the DNA that's inside. Um, and so uh, when Yorgos and I learned about this problem, we were very excited because we, we the lab really enjoys kind of pushing these limits of mass, me mass measurement. And this seemed like a really good um, opportunity to apply some of our tools. So how do we measure mass? Well, we do this with a cantilever that's being driven at its resonant frequency. And the resonant frequency, of course, depends very strongly on both the mass um, and the spring constant. Um, and so what we do is in real time, we track this resonant frequency um, and it's hollow inside the cantilever. We flow fluid. And so the particle flows through it. And as it goes along the cantilever, the frequency drops and then it turns the corner and the frequency returns back up to its normal value. So this change in the resonant frequency represents how much the particle weighs in the solution that it's in. So this is called the buoyant mass, although I'll just be calling it a mass uh, throughout the talk. Now, over the years, my lab has made these devices at a wide range of sizes. Um, and the reason why we do this is that the mass precision is directly related to the mass of the device itself. So the, the, the lighter the device is, the, the smaller of a mass that we can resolve. And by doing this, we've actually been able to span about five orders of magnitude in terms of, of precision from our biggest one to our smallest one. So these ones here, 15 by 20s, we use for mammalian cells. They can resolve about, uh, depending on the experiment, about uh, 100 femtograms or 0.1 picogram. Um, and if you compare that, say, to an activated T cell, those weigh almost 100 picograms. Um, and then if you think about E. coli, uh, E. coli weighs several hundred femtograms. So these are just order of magnitude estimates. And so for E. coli, we tend to use these smaller devices to really resolve um, subtle changes. And then of course, for viruses, we're really thinking about uh, these smaller devices that uh, have resolution um, on the atom scale. And so I, I particularly wanted to, to focus then on, on these smaller ones. And here, what you're seeing is a micrograph of one of these devices. Um, so this, this one actually has a channel dimension of, of about 400 nanometers by a micron. It's around 20 microns long. Um, this is a vacuum cavity in here. So this is vibrating actually in vacuum. These are two fluid, what we call bypass channels on, that flank either side of it. And so this little hole in here, this is where fluid can flow into this buried channel that you can't see, but the particles will flow through here. Uh, come in here, make a, a little U, and then come back out through the exit bypass channel. Uh, and these things resonate at a frequency of several hundred megahertz. So let me show you some experiments from these. And these come particularly from uh, Salim Okum and Nate uh, Cermak, who uh, developed uh, th this method uh, at the time when they were in the lab. 
not quite, this is six years ago. And what they did in this experiment is they mixed together three different particle types, uh, 10, 15, and 20 nanometer gold particles. And just to calibrate you here, uh, 10 nanometer gold particle weighs 10 nanograms. And so here's what they're measuring in a two second time interval. And you can see all these different peaks that come by as the particles flow through. If you look at this on a longer time scale, now we're looking at a minute time scale, you could begin to see um, and identify uh, the different populations of the particles that are, are present here. And so if we zoom into this a little bit more closely, uh, here now we've calibrated uh, the frequency response to mass. So these numbers here are mass um, and autograms. Um, and you can see the signal from these different populations. And in this case, since we know the density, we can make a nice histogram to show the size distribution. But let's look more closely at this top plot. Um, could we resolve uh, a virus, the AAV? Um, and the answer is almost, but not quite. So here are the 10 anagram gold particles. You can see their weights here. And so if we wanted to resolve a two anagram uh, virus, uh, we, we, we'd have to get really lucky on some very quiet period to be able to do that. But realistically, we couldn't. And certainly, we couldn't look at a difference of an anagram uh, between those two. So at this point, there's two options. So one option is to make new devices that are smaller to resolve even uh, smaller changes in mass. That's really expensive. It takes a long time, uh, not easy to do. And we're certainly thinking about those directions. Um, but there's another way around this problem. And I wanted to present this to you. It's a very clever approach. It was developed uh, by Tomas Berg. Uh, and Tomas actually was a PhD student in my lab many, many years ago who actually developed the uh, SMR, uh, the microchannel resonator device for his PhD thesis. But this is an idea he came up with and, and demonstrated in his own lab. Um, and so I wanted to, to tell you about it. And what Tomas will say is that, okay, if you want to resolve lower, you want to get your anagram limit and below, you can do that, um, but you have to be willing to give up the ability to size individual particles. And for this particular ap application, we're actually okay with that. We just need to know what fraction of these viruses have an empty capsid or not a, a full capsid in them. We just need a number, just a fractional content. And that's what we could use for our manufacturing feedback loop uh, process. So um, this, this technique is, could be really good for this. And let me show you the idea. Uh, and for those of you that are familiar with fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, you might recognize this. So, um, here's a heavy particle that comes through. Clearly, we see a signal. Now, in this diagram, Tomas has particles that are too small to weigh individually, but there's a lot of them that he has here in the channel. And so all their masses add up to contribute to a signal. But the signal looks noisy because of all these different particles that are flowing through at different times and different speeds. And so you, you see this noisy sort of signal. Uh, and what Tomas showed, and I won't go into detail here, is that you can actually infer or directly um, calculate from this signal what the average mass is of the particles that are in the channel. And, and let me show you an experiment that he did. Okay, so he took heavy particles, 1.5 micron polystyrene beads that you can easily resolve, mixed it in with small particles that you couldn't, 20 autogram particles. Here's what he saw. So these peaks here, uh, very clearly, these are the 1.5 micron particles. The beads mixed in are somewhere in here. Um, and let's look at this data in a slightly different experiment. So here, Tomas took the same beads, um, and black is no beads. Uh, green is uh, some beads there, a certain fraction, and then the blue is even at a higher concentration of the beads. And these are all noise signals. You can squint and kind of see if you can uh, infer a difference between these. But uh, what Tomas did is he took the autocorrelation of each one of these. If you plot the autocorrelation, you actually see a very clear difference. In fact, if you look at time equals zero, uh, this really represents the magnitude of the noise that's in the signal. And you can see very clearly that the higher concentration is up here. Here's the green one. And then the buffer with nothing in it is there. Um, so very intriguing. He's really pushed the limits down to be able to make particles that you wouldn't or ordinarily be able to do in kind of the standard mode. Okay, so let me point out Tomas's channels that are using uh, a three by eight micron in cross section. So here's the question that, that we've been thinking about. So if a three by eight micron channel can resolve these 20 autogram particles. What could we do if we scale this down uh, to our smaller channels? And so this is something that Yurgos has been thinking a lot about and working on. Uh, he's done a lot of the theory and estimates to kind of model these systems and look at the scaling. And what Yurgos came up with is that from the scaling down to the side, we should, we ought to be able to see 175 fold improvement um, in, in, the, in the resolution. So if we divide that by where we are, that puts us close to uh, 100 zeptograms 
So I, I should say, though, this is a very conservative estimate. It's not a theoretical limit. So Tomas, in his paper, actually describes how, in principle, he could go much lower than this 20 atograms. We want to take something practical that actually has been measured before, just to get kind of a, a ballpark of something conservative that we should be able to do, 100 atograms. So that's pretty good, because the difference we're looking at is one atogram. So that, that, that ought to be enough. And so let me show you some very preliminary results uh, from Yorgos's experiments. And so he's taking these small uh, 0.7 by one micron devices. Here's his signal if he flows buffer through this. So this is a three second uh, time scale here. And, and here's the noise and, and plotted in Hertz. So now Yorgos measures the viruses that have empty capsids in them. And um, you can see just by eye even in this case that there's a really clear difference in the noise properties between this uh, when you introduce the viruses into the channel. And then when he flows in the ones with full caps, as you can see, even a greater difference um, in the, the noise property um, from the empty ones. So these results are preliminary. Uh, Yorgos is spending a lot of time now thinking about kind of the robustness, the repeatability, and, and, and quantification. Can, what kind of, what level, what's the smallest fraction of, of full cap or empty capsids could we pick out within a, a population of viruses? And so these are the experiments that are going on right now ultimately with the aim to, to bring this into an inline monitoring tool um, within the, the, the culturing of the cells and, and production. Okay, so um, this concludes the first part um, of the presentation. And I wanna go back to this list of uh, pictures of devices. And I actually left one out here. We made one pretty recently that's gigantic. So this one has like 60 by 60 micron. We even made 100 by 100 micron channel devices. And we did this because we wanted to start to look at organoids, uh, cancer tumors organoids, and to be able to see how they change from drug response. And that's work that's going on in the lab. But Timu um, uh, has come up with a, a, another uh, use of these devices to look at a pretty interesting question. Um, and so I'm gonna hand this over to, to Timu and he's gonna tell you uh, about what, what, um, what has been done with these devices in a different application. So uh, Timu, I'm gonna stop sharing and see if you can pick it up. Yep, do you see my screen? You do. Excellent. So uh, thank you, Scott. And, and just like Scott and Jean said, thank you for the organizers. This has been a wonderful series and it's it's great pleasure to be a part of this. So <clears throat> really, really what the mass measurements in this larger size scales allows you to ask from a very cell biology perspective is that how does growth behave if, if across size scales? Uh, really, Classical questions in cell biology are things like, does growth scale linearly with cell size? Is it exponential or is it something more complicated? And if you think this question to its extremes, then if a cell grows larger and larger, then at some point we would assume that the cell starts to experience transport-based limitations to its growth. So surface to volume scaling might change, dis diffusion distances inside the cell might change, and these might start actually limit the growth rate of a cell. And therefore, really being able to measure the growth of a single cell across large size scales is what is needed to answer these questions and how this behave. But whenever you do this in most model systems, you also have to be able to separate the effects caused by cell cycle from the effects caused by cell size. And this is a classical problem that I'm gonna illustrate actually in a second. But the way we measure growth, just to be clear with this SMR devices, <clears throat> It's quite simple. We simply flow the particle back and forth through the cantilever. And the environment inside the cantilever is controlled. There's a certain temperature that we control. The pH is controlled. And um, on average, we see that the average growth rate is comparable to what you see in bulk culture. Now, if we then just look at how the data looks like, and this data comes from the what we call small channel SMRs. These are uh, devices where we have 15 by 20 micron diameter cavity inside the cantilever, then this is a classical example of the data. So you can see in black a single cell that we follow the mass of, and then the cell divides. And at every cell division, mass, cut, mass obviously cuts in half, but the system automatically follows only one of the daughter cells. So we get this kind of ancestral lineages collected. And from this kind of data, it's quite easy to start plotting mass accumulation rate, in other words, growth rate. <coughs> and uh, Oh yes, uh, important note is that all the data here and what I'll be showing to you comes from a mouse lymphocytic leukemia cell line. But then if we start looking at the growth rates, 
And I'm going to be presenting to you what we call growth efficiency. This is the mass normalized growth rate. So you could think of it as like size specific growth rate in our work. Um, <clears throat> what you see in a normally proliferating culture is that growth is not simply exponential. So the very smallest cells in a population grow much more slowly than middle sized cells in the population. And then as cells grow even larger, growth rate not only plateaus, but even declines. And if you had purely exponential growth, you would assume that you would essentially see a flat line on this plot, that the mass normalized growth rate would be the same no matter what your size is. But with this kind of data, <clears throat> where just for the record, here and everywhere else, we're cutting out what happens in mitosis because growth dynamics there are way too complicated and they will just shadow everything else. Um, but in this kind of data, you always have to ask that, is this a cell size or cell cycle effect? So is it that newborn cells grow slowly and s phase cells grow fast, or is it actually something size related? And to really address this, we figured that polyploidy could be the model to look at. So you can make a very simple hypothesis that how, how, how does growth behave as your cells grow into polyploidy? So I just showed you, showed you how growth efficiency normally scales with cell size within a normal cell cycle. But what if you induce polyploidy and the cell will simply skip division and keep on growing and enter a new cell cycle? Will you see essentially cell size dependent growth where at some unknown rate, growth rates are gonna decline kind of on the same trajectory that they did at the end of normal cell cycle? Or are you gonna see the complete opposite effect where you're gonna see a cell cycle dependent growth where this oscillate or this nonlinear behavior repeats itself in every cell cycle as the cells grow in the polyploid. And this is a pretty clear hypothesis to start comparing the growth with, um, but obviously we need, we need a model that behaves in a good way for this. And the good thing about the leukemia cells that we typically study is that they can easily make them in the very polyploid and they keep on growing. So we can go from, in the DNA histograms below, you can see that we can go from two end cells all the way up to 128 end cells. We've done this with multiple means of inducing polyploidy. Uh, this is an example where we use order B inhibitor to just block cytokinesis. And visually, the way these cells look like is that the cells are very spherical, obviously, to start with. These are suspension-grown leukemia cells. But even after you induce polyploidy, they retain this spherical morphology. So you would assume that there's gonna be surface volume scaling issues here. But then if we actually look at the data and in normal size range, we see this nonlinear behavior that I've seen you, then as these cells grow into polyploidy, we actually see that with every single cell cycle, this nonlinear growth behavior repeats itself. So that nonlinear pattern, it, it's something cell cycle related. Uh, but we also wanted to quantify that is there a bit of downward slope in that, that could there be some cell size dependent effect that you, once you get too large, your growth rate slowly decreases. And what you're seeing here at the bottom is actually a compilation of all the data we've gathered with, with drug, without drug, with another drug, different devices and so on. But if we simplify that comparison and only look at data where we have that order B inhibitor drug present, so all of the cells be influenced by drug-induced toxicity and stuff like that. And then we plot our data on this classical allometric scaling plot where you have growth rate on log axis on Y scale and you have the cell mass on a log axis on X scale. What you see is that the scaling exponent is exactly one. So in other words, growth over large size scales is purely exponential. Uh, and I want to highlight, we've scanned through basically a hundredfold range of cell size in a single cell type and growth remains purely exponential over the large size ranges. Um, but within each cell cycle, growth rate varies, right? Now we can also carry out a very simple validation experiment for this idea and uh, simply arrest cells in G2. So if we are right that the, uh, what I'm gonna call now the oscillating behavior in the growth, if that is really a cell cycle effect, <clears throat> then that should not repeat when we arrest cells in G2, but growth should plateau on a certain level because the cells won't enter the next cell cycle. 
or again, if, if growth is cell site dependent, growth might be declining. But what we see is exactly the hypothesis that growth has this cell cycle dependent growth manner, where growth plateaus the level where we, that we normally see in control cells in G2, and it doesn't start a new oscillation. So with these pretty simple experiments, we can, we can actually reach quite nice conclusions that, like I said before, growth really seems to behave exponentially over these very long size scales. And cell cycle is what, what matters a lot more for the growth efficiency of these cells. But if you put this into a bigger context, I, I mentioned the transport limitations in the beginning, and uh, we don't see any we don't see any evidence for transport limitations starting to impede growth. So obviously, at some point, if your cells would grow much much larger, or if you just had less nutrients in your media, at some point, things like diffusion have to become limiting. But in the kind of classical culture conditions, when you grow your cells in RPMI and you look at the size range that covers in the human body, apart from the O side, this covers pretty much all proliferating cells. We don't see these transport limitations influencing growth. So it doesn't mean they don't exist, but, but maybe we shouldn't invoke those as an explanation for everything. Uh, so yeah, this was a very, very simple, but in my opinion, quite quite a powerful demonstration of what you can do with good mass measurements when you have tools like the SMRs. And really the people that we have to acknowledge for this work are Jun Ho Kang, who's a former student in our lab, and most importantly, Mary, Mary Mu on the left there. She is the one who got these large neural devices to work, did the experiments with them, and really what the operating principles of the SMR devices are the same, no matter what size range you're in, there's always engineering hurdles going to different size scale. And Mary was able to overcome all of those that we can actually measure very large particles. And nowadays also actually organoids, which is quite, quite fascinating. So, and obviously there are other people from the lab that helped a lot as well. So with that, I'm gonna let Scott have the final word here. Yeah, and I, I just will uh, go back and acknowledge from the first part of the talk, um, uh, Yurgos Katsikas, uh, and, and a postdoc in the lab, um, who's here, as I mentioned, and I was Huang, a very talented undergraduate student who Yurgos has been mentoring on this project. Um, and also uh, the devices uh, that we have been doing these AAV measurements with that I showed you at the very end were, were made by CEA Leti, uh, Vincent, Vincent Agash, and, and it, that a team there that he leads. So with that, we'll conclude and, and take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott and Timu. Um, before asking the questions that have come in via chat, I want to ask a high level question, which may also help contextualize for the very general audience here. Um, would you motivate why cell mass, cell growth rate are good readouts of functional phenotypes of cells? Why? So, 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 so you know, you're preaching to the choir yeah. as far as I'm concerned, yeah. but. I would appreciate yeah. a quick elevator summary. I, I don't know if I have a quick summary, but um, looking, if, if you want to study growth, the, one of the most fundamental things that anybody studies in cell biology, looking the way we think of growth, growth is really increase in biomass. It's not, it's not volume increase because that is defined, that can be influenced strongly by uh, osmotic effects. And it's, it's not, protein synthesis, because you have examples like a uh, um, senescent cell will have high protein synthesis and it's just going to degrade a lot of protein and secrete a lot of protein, but it's not actually growing the cell itself. So by looking at the mass of the cell and how mass accumulates, it's, it's one of the, it, it gets more to the kind of cornerstones of what growth is. And, and why would a growth be the functional readout that you're interested in? Well, I think you can try and understand that through it, it obviously depends on like the underlying biological questions you're asking. Our lab is always interested in cancer questions. So growth is kind of, it, it, there's no cancer if there's no growth. Uh, that's one, but it, it also, I, I think it's a very general readout of the cell's functional state. We, we know that growth regulation of cells, if, if you have problems on whether it's transcriptional level, whether it's singling level, whether you have problems with your nutrient uptake process, it, it doesn't matter. It, 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 growth is dependent on so many other functional processes in the cell. 
that it functions as this kind of general readout. Perfect, thanks. So um, question from Nancy Ford relating to the first part of the talk. Um, could you flow back and forth to get multiple measurements in the same virus and thereby increase precision, albeit with lower throughput? Yeah, no, that, that's a great thought. Um, and it, you're right, it, it would allow us to increase um, our precision quite a bit if we can measure changes on the same virus. I mean, for this particular problem, it's more static. We have viruses that we need to characterize their state. But, but in, in principle, if we wanted to do experiments to look how things change with perturbation or, or different types of things like that, trapping really would be the way to do it. Um, it's a little harder to trap these smaller particles, so uh, and we we are, don't do as well as, as what uh, Timo has shown you with with both mammalian cells we trap bacteria, mammalian cells, and even these really big polyploid cells. But trapping viruses is, is, is more challenging, so we're not we're not quite there yet. But in principle, it should be possible. Great, thanks. So we have a couple of technical questions, um, which I'm going to combine from Rudra Biswas and Jean. Um, what are the error bars on the growth rate plot? So that's part one. Oh. So uh, essentially the error bars on the growth rate plot is that for <clears throat> what, what we plot is that we plot single cells, we plot the growth rate and how it not oscillates. And then we've done just done this tens and tens of times and the error bars are standard deviations. And what you see there is a mean of all the cells. Okay. And the second part of the question is, what is the contribution from uncertainty in knowledge of cell density? So I'm going to fold into that uh, related question from Jean. Does the cell volume grow at the same rate as mass? Jean is curious about whether mass density brackets protein concentration stays constant. Yep. yep. Uh, the lab has done previously work, so, so you can use SMR to actually look at cell density by measuring the same cell in two density medias. And we know that within a normal cell cycle, uh, density is essentially constant, apart from mitosis, and we're cutting out the mitotic sections out of this data. So then the question is that once you grow the cells to polyploid, it does density, does density re remain constant? And we haven't been able to carry out those high precision density measurements in the very large cells, but there's essentially two parts to this answer. One is that we've carried out very rough volume measurements and tried to compare if volume increases roughly as much as mass, and it looks like it does. But this is, this is a rough estimate. Uh, what I think is actually more convincing is that um, you can make this naive, naive, well, it's actually not that naive assumption, but if, if you work in the cell size field, looking at cell size homeostasis, then you can make a very simple assumption that in every cell cycle, cell should double its mass. Now, when we measure buoyant mass, actually, with these devices, um, if the cell doubled its mass, but it didn't double its volume, or it more than doubled its volume, that there was a change in density as the cells grow larger and larger, we wouldn't see a doubling of buoyant mass as the cells grow in the polyploid. But what wasn't well illustrated in the slides that I showed you is that when we grow the cells to polyploid, it's, it's exactly a doubling of mass no matter if you go from 2N to 4N cell cycle, or if you go from like 64N to 128N cell cycle, it's still exactly doubling the point mass. So if there's a density change, it's a pretty curious matchup that that still happens. Great, thank you. So let me wrap up with one more question for the formal part of the Q&A, and then we'll go into informal discussions. Um, this one is from Raphael at 1157. Thanks for the interesting talk. How accurately is it possible to calculate the mass of the virus from its nucle nucleic acid content and capsid composition? Did you compare the measured mass to the calculated mass for viruses? Yeah, so let me turn that over to Yorgos because he's um, been thinking a lot about that and doing some of those measurements. So Yorgos. Uh, first of all, the theoretical uh, cal uh, resolution we have calculated is around 10% of DNA content, if you want to define your resolution. Practical resolution in terms of experiment is currently something we are under, we are uh, determining. There are sources of error that affect the final, um, the final like uh, precision of the measurement. But what I can, I can tell you is that we did compare the measured mass 
to the calculated mass of viruses, what you, you would expect if you were compared the our data to data from biochemistry measurements. And we saw we could distinguish at least between full and empty capsids theoretically. So the signals you got that Scott showed that resulted in masses that were at least 10 to 15% close within the expected value. 